Your paper is a motion on a hardship fund for businesses excluded from existing COVID-19 support packages. I will ask the clerk to read the motion. That this assembly is deeply concerned at the significant impact that the COVID-19 COVID-19 pandemic has had on the local economy, acknowledges the substantial financial support package put in place by the UK government to support employers, employees and the self-employed, recognises that thousands of sole traders and micro-businesses in Northern Ireland have not been able to access financial support, and calls on the Minister for the Economy to establish a new fit-for-purpose business hardship fund targeted at those businesses that have so far been excluded from existing support packages. And I call on John Stewart to move the motion. Speaker. Uh, thank you. And, uh, the Business Committee has agreed to allow up to one hour uh, 30 minutes for this debate. The proposer of the motion will have 10 minutes to propose and 10 minutes to wind. All other speakers will have five minutes. Please open the debate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I welcome the opportunity to bring this motion to the House today and thank the Minister also for coming along today. Although I would say it is regrettable that it has taken a motion from the Ulster Unionist Party here to highlight the plight of businesses that have fallen through the cracks and been excluded or unable to available packages to date. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this issue has gained a lot of traction recently due to, in part, the uh, passionate and sustained lobbying from groups like Excluded NI or excellent business organisations like Enterprise NI, who have actively um, highlighted the plight of many thousands of directors, sole traders and business people who have to date been unable to avail of any government support, along with the need to see a business-focused economic recovery plan. I have to say, Mr Speaker, it has not taken me until recent weeks to acknowledge their plight, and this is an issue that I and others have been actively promoting since early April. When the initial business support grants of ten and twenty-five thousand pounds were ruled out, we all welcomed these and understood the reasons behind getting them out so quickly. But I said at that stage that it was imperative that we created other schemes in addition that would sweep up companies that had been unable to access those grants at that stage. As the campaign has grown, the Minister for the Economy has repeatedly said that designing and rolling out a new scheme would not be her remit, but would be that of the Executive. However, back in March, Mr Speaker, the Minister herself acknowledged the issue and said, I hope to be in a position to respond further, to meet the particular needs of businesses here, particularly around self-employed people and for businesses who cannot avail themselves of other measures that are available. Mr Speaker, the Minister acknowledged back in March that it was her remit, and I argue today that that it still is. Whether it was at the ad hoc committee or at the economy committee or in debates in this chamber on economic recovery, I have been at pains to point out from the beginning that while this was the biggest health crisis in a century, it was quickly becoming the biggest economic crisis we had ever faced. From the outset, I have argued for an ambitious economic recovery plan, but also creative and generous government intervention in the form of economic support packages to businesses who, through no fault of their own, had seen their turnover decimated by the impact of coronavirus and lockdown measures. If this required a complete reprioritisation of our government and executive spending, then so be it. There is no doubt, Mr Speaker, that via the Job Retention Scheme, the Self-Employed Scheme and the ten and £25,000 grant scheme, a huge broad brushstroke approach was applied to business support, and I fully acknowledge just how vast this support was and continues to be. That was essential, absolutely necessary, and has saved hundreds of thousands of jobs and countless businesses from going under. And for those that were able to avail of that support, it has been an absolute lifeline. However, given the nature of these schemes and the significant, a significant minority of businesses and entrepreneurs did not meet the qualifying criteria. This was quickly recognised and as far back as March I joined Economy Committee colleagues in calling for a bespoke hardship grant targeting these people to be established. When the Department of Economy finally announced their business hardship grant back in May, it was cautiously welcomed and felt that it would be able to provide the safety net for businesses who had missed out. It was then, Mr Speaker, hugely lamentable then when not only did the qualifying criteria change three times in the 24 hours prior to its launch, but ultimately the criteria led to thousands of self-employed directors, sole traders and social enterprises again being excluded or unable to avail. So obtuse was the criteria that almost a quarter of the hardship grant returned unspent. This underspend, along with funds returned from the original business grant scheme, totalling over £53 million, were returned to the Executive back in July. 
So why is it, Mr Speaker, that almost two months on, and despite the protestations of myself and other members of the Economy Committee and sustained lobbying from business groups, there is no new bid from the Department of Economy to create a new support scheme for those businesses continued to cling on by their fingernails? Mr Speaker, scarcely a week passes without a business person from my constituency or across the country contacting me or a colleague, often in tears at the hardship they currently face. Private dentists, consultants, architects, promoters, events managers, chefs, drivers, micro-manufacturers, the list goes on. These people are the personification of the entrepreneurial spirit that we as an Assembly are supposed to champion. Individuals who perhaps in the last two or three years have given up lucrative careers in the private or public sector to start their own career in in, in, um, being self-employed, blissfully unaware of the devastation around the corner. Unable to access schemes, they have been initially knuckled down, praying that support would come. Many have taken out loans, have maxed out credit cards, borrowed from families, but were resolute in their determination to survive and convinced that they would not be forgotten about by the Minister or by the Executive. Sadly, Mr Speaker, they have been forgotten about, and it has taken this motion today to get this issue on the agenda. I understand that there are always practical areas, grey areas and funding implications, and I understand that the Minister has many plates to spin in her portfolio, but the fundamental responsibility for a package of support for excluded businesses and business owners must rest and does rest with the Department of Economy. The Minister can't take credit for the previous schemes when rolling them out and then simply wash her hands of them when these new versions are not coming forward. If we take the example of the self-employed hardship scheme, departmental officials tell us at the committee that they're unable to provide a new scheme potentially because the raw data is not there from HMRC, but the minister tells us it's not her responsibility. So what is it? The department can't or it won't? Or is it that the minister agrees with her permanent secretary who told the the economy committee two weeks ago if it is only to keep businesses going for six or eight weeks As we head into more turbulent times, we have to wonder if the resources would be better deployed elsewhere. Tell that to a director of a company who is lying awake at night wondering how to pay the bills, who has maxed out every line of credit they've got but is resolute in their determination to survive and watched other businesses receive help and then they've been said, you're not worth saving or if you survive this long, you'll be okay. Is that the sort of support we want to see from this executive and from the minister? And I ask the question. Mr Speaker, the Minister in ad hoc committees and briefings to to our Economy Committee has rightly said she will not be found wanting when it comes to an economic recovery plan or providing support for businesses. When I questioned her about a similar scheme to the Wealth Resilience Fund at the Committee in May, she says we will be looking for a package for the Northern Ireland economy. We will be looking along the lines of the Wealth Resilient Funds, for example, but we will not be looking at just mitigation measures. We will be looking at something to take us a step further. Four months later, we have no sight of any bespoke resilience fund. We have no sight of any bids or any plans for a new hardship grant scheme. And we have no sight of the full economic recovery plan. I'll finish, Mr Speaker, with a heartfelt plea to the Minister on behalf of all those business owners in Northern Ireland who are committed to survival but crying out for similar support measures that others have received. Can I implore the Minister and her departmental officials to go away and urgently create a new fit-for-purpose hardship scheme that will target those to date that have been excluded? If there are difficulties or the rest of the executive will not commit to releasing funds, then our focus will turn to them. But there must be a bid from the Department of Economy based on a credible, shovel-ready scheme that will show businesses out there that they are committed to supporting them and easing their financial woes. In the absence of any such proposal or commitment, we can only assume that the Department is being led by the remarks of the Permanent Secretary to say they are not worth saving. Thank you, Mr Speaker, for the time today, and I urge all to support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, and I call Gordon Dunn. Mr Speaker, and I too uh, welcome the opportunity to speak on what is a very important issue. I think we all recognise the significant impact that COVID-19 has had on our local economy. We all acknowledge the very significant amount of real financial support which has been delivered by our UK government under executive over the last six months, particularly through the Department for the Economy. The, the Department for the Economy has provided £340 million of support to over 30,000 businesses through the business support schemes for large, small and micro-businesses throughout Northern Ireland. 
We must recognize and commend the efforts of the Economy Minister Diane Dodds in supporting the local economy through such a challenging period. And the department staff, LPS and Invest NA staff, all of whom have been involved in grant administration and dealing with their day-to-day -day queries from our constituents. These support measures, alongside the UK Government initiatives, including the furlough scheme, the self-employed income support scheme and the various rates relief measures introduced, have all been absolutely critical for the survival of so many businesses and protecting thousands of jobs right across Northern Ireland. The Minister has rightly prioritised our economic recovery and the publication of the economic recovery strategy, Rebuilding a Stronger Economy, setting out the framework to deliver higher paying jobs, a highly skilled workforce and a more regionally balanced economy. The establishment of an expert-led economic advisory group and a tourism recovery steering group are other progressive measures aimed at stimulating rebuilding and reviewing our economy and, importantly, giving confidence for the future. There is also the immediate challenge of avoiding another lockdown, which would have a devastating impact upon our economy and our ability to recover already from the past six months. Every sector has been affected over the last six months. However, there are undoubtedly certain sectors which have been hit, hit hardest, and some are still unable to trade given the restrictions which still remain. Some sectors more significantly impacted than in others include tourism, travel, hospitality, aerospace, leisure and art sectors, and these will require tailored support ongoing. There are many small business owners out there, which has already been mentioned, who initially took great risks to start their own business, which is highly commendable and something we fully support. But with COVID-19, these businesses have been hit hard with a drop in demand, a loss of production, or indeed the reduction, as we are all aware, of a footfall within our towns, cities and villages. All of this has had a detrimental effect and a major impact on these businesses. The internet too remains a growing challenge for retail and service sectors, but it's also an opportunity for business growth, and more could be done through our various agencies to support and encourage those businesses to adapt and diversify. Whilst we actively are lobbying for the extension of the furlough scheme, we must be realistic and realise that it will have a limited lifespan. But its continuation in a phased basis is critical, especially over the next few months. There is a need for additional support to sustain existing jobs and businesses in Northern Ireland. And the role of Invest NI to look at alternative support measures for businesses and support upskilling, training, online activity, innovation and research and development. I believe the UK Government and the Executive must make strategic interventions to stimulate and protect more sectors facing the greatest ongoing challenges in the immediate term. I would urge the Executive to look at all the options to see what support can be given to sole traders, small and micro businesses, and we recognise the pain and the loss they are suffering. They should come to a decision to utilise any underspend from the various grant support funds and support those hardest hit as we seek to sustain and re rebuild our economy for the future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. And I call Keeb Archibald. Um, and I'm glad to have the opportunity to speak to this debate today. And I'd like to thank my economy committee colleague, John Stewart, for bringing forward the motion. Over the past number of months, I have consistently highlighted those businesses and entrepreneurs who have missed out from both the British Government and the Executive's support interventions, and the Economy Committee collectively has listened to and made the case for the extension of support to those missed out from the other schemes. We all recognise the scale of the interventions that have been made to support businesses. Over £700 million has been made available by the Executive in rates relief and the business grants to support businesses impacted by COVID-19. We also recognise there is a need to focus on and to fund the economic recovery. However, simply pointing that out repeatedly to those who have missed out on any support due to their business type or when or how they establish their business is neither helpful or welcome. Many sole traders, newly self-employed, businesses with no premises and small manufacturing businesses have all missed out simply by the nature of their business. 
As Mr Stewart has mentioned, um, we have been told the necessary data to target newly self-employed individuals, for example, has not been forthcoming from HMRC. The Economy Committee last week strongly endorsed that we inquire if the Executive would fund a grant if HMRC will deliver it directly to those individuals. I hope the Economy Minister in her response will indicate if she is willing to consider that. I argued for support beyond the original grant schemes and the Minister agreed we needed a fund for those who fell through the cracks and we got the hardship fund. When the criteria were published, there were clearly those again who missed out and I argued for the widening of the criteria of the hardship fund to include those still excluded and was told there was a limit to the funding available. However, it's since become apparent that there was over 60 million of underspend across the grant schemes, which shows supports could have been widened. And surely many lessons have been learned that would help in the speedy design and delivery of some tailored and targeted supports that de would deliver much needed and very welcome support. Every MLA in this assembly has been contacted by business owners and entrepreneurs who have been unable to access support some of them not even eligible for universal credit. I have listened and I have read about the depths of despair some of those individuals, with bills mounting and no sign of any income, many have already taken on further debt that they aren't sure will ever be paid. We are all realists here too. We know not every business or job will be saved. But for those who have missed out, it is about giving them a lifeline to keep the lights on, give them a chance to reopen, just like all those who got support simply because they had a premises. These are business owners and entrepreneurs, hairdressers, tradespeople, photographers, taxi drivers, small manufacturing companies that have created jobs and support families. These small and micro businesses and their workers are the backbone of our economy. This isn't about pouring money into business accounts simply to pay bills. It's about protecting livelihoods and supporting workers and families. I have consistently argued to the Economy Minister, and also to my own executive colleagues for that matter, that we need to find a way to support those who have missed out on all supports to date. The Finance Minister has made clear he will consider bids brought forward to support those excluded from other schemes. But other ministers, and in particular the Economy Minister, need to make a bid for funding to support these individuals. We have heard about the bids the Economy Minister has made in relation to economic recovery. And there is certainly a real need to have an economic recovery strategy which addresses the long-term structural issues in our local economy, including low productivity, by focusing on skills development and strengthening workers' rights, as well as the economic recovery from COVID-19. However, in doing that, we need to instil confidence to those businesses and entrepreneurs that make up our economy that we are willing to support them through the difficult times, as well as reap the benefits in the good times. I will therefore be supporting the motion and I would urge other members to do likewise. Graham Elgott. Graham Elgott and I call uh, Pat Kedney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I want to first recognise, as others have pointed out, that the Executive has provided a lot of support. They have pro provided rate relief schemes, grant schemes, micro business schemes, help for tourism, uh, apprenticeships higher education, supply chains, but nothing for 100,000 single-person businesses and newly self-employed. This cannot be right, Mr Speaker. Even those who have been self-employed for a long time were hit in the subtle differences in the self-employed income support scheme and the job retention scheme. If you were an employee with a salary over £50,000, you were covered by the furlock scheme up to the tune of £30,000. If you were self-employed and earned the same, you are excluded from any support. We can see the impact in all of our constituencies with the rise in numbers of those on universal credits. They, this, these are people that have worked hard to set up their businesses. They are the backbone of our economy. Surely it has to be more efficient to support our workers to stay and work rather than putting them through this hardship of being unemployed. We all have stories of those that have been left behind. I was contacted by one person who had worked hard to get extra qualifications while working two retail jobs. After three years borrowing money from their family and their friends, 
And while caring for the young family, they opened the doors of their businesses, their business and the start of the year. As soon as lockdown was announced, they contacted me about what support was available. One week passed, two weeks, and I kept telling them that I had asked the questions. I hoped something would be announced soon. One month went by, then two. Now six months have passed, and they have got absolutely nothing. The loans they borrowed from friends and family are gone, the business is gone, and they are on universal credits. You know, to go in and open a business takes great courage. Uh, you're moving out of your comfort zone, you go in and you do the best that you possibly can. That becomes part of your life, your way of living. It changes your whole outlook on what you're doing. And believe me, I have never come across anyone who has been in business that isn't a hard worker. I can tell you, no such a thing as 37 and a half hours or 40 hours. You do what has to be done. This did not happen. This person has gone through so much and was contributing positively to our economy in comparison to the big schemes already announced. It will only take a modest scheme, the Minister, to cover those that have received absolutely nothing. In uh, this time, it is on all of us in this chamber to help all of our constituents. Surely this is uh, more important at this time of crisis. I hope you all support the motion and that the Minister takes the view of this chamber on board and puts in place this vital support for our businesses should, should be kept going longer than in six months. Do I have any more time, Mr Speaker? I do, because I want to bring to the point that uh, uh, my colleague uh, my, uh, uh, from uh, South Belfast made in concerning uh, the letter that he wrote uh, to the Department um, I have raised numerous times in the Finance Committee who this sits with. Uh, on Monday, the news came out that the First and Deputy First Minister were going to bestow powers on the, uh, on ask, the Minister for Infrastructure. I, Mr. Kennedy, so, pardon? Could I ask you, you're, you're up to speak on a motion. Yes, I'm speaking on, and this is related to the motion as well, sir. Well, could you, as you, in your own immortal words, yes, yes so I want yes. to ask the Economy Minister to look at the powers that she does have and stop trying to put the blame on other people out there. Deliver what powers you have. If you're not able to do it, then pass it on to some other department. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. And of course, Stuart Dixon. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank uh, the mover of the motion as well. I, I rise, of course, to support the motion because it's a topic that has been on our minds for the last number of months, but much more importantly, one that has caused considerable distress and upset to sole traders and others across Northern Ireland. I'm deeply disappointed that we still have no tangible progress. The national support measures have not been perfect, but they have provided a substantial structure to keep businesses going through this very difficult time. Nonetheless, there have been gaps where devolved regions have stepped in, or in the case of Northern Ireland, not stepped in. Nonetheless, I do want to thank the Minister for agreeing to meet with myself and representatives of excluded NI last week. I think she will agree that their arguments were persuasive and clear. And now it is the time for action. Over the past few months, the Minister and the Department have told us that it's too complex to do, it's too difficult. Some say that if they've survived this long through the worst of the crisis, why do they need any assistance? Well, I will tell you, Mr. Speaker and Minister, there are business people that pay tax, contribute to our economy, and sell Northern Ireland to the world. We must not turn our backs on them. They have exhausted personal funds and in some cases taken on substantial debt to keep their businesses going. Help may mean uh, the difference between closure or going on and moving into recovery. The reality, Mr Speaker, is that this can be done because it's quite clear that it's happening in other parts of the United Kingdom. We all know that Scotland has access to HMRC, HMRC tax information. But that's not the case in Wales or in any of the English regions, all who have stepped up to deliver for these businesses. During our meeting last Thursday, it was agreed with the Minister that she would once again contact HMRC to look into how we can overcome these complex information issues, if indeed they are complex. I welcome this, but we now need action. Mr Speaker, why would someone want to take the risk of setting up a business in Northern Ireland. 
we would not be having this debate today if these businesses were located in any other part of the United Kingdom. So why is the Minister denying businesses here the opportunity to receive help? Money must, of course, be carefully and responsibly spent, and we've heard outrageous figures mentioned in this chamber by way of support. We need to break these businesses down into small bites and work out what they need. Some can, be some can be helped by just a few thousand pounds. Very few are actually looking for the large sums of money that have been paid out to others. Yes. Um, thank the member for taking an intervention. A response to an assembly written question um, uh, to me had indicated that there were 2,000 people who became newly self-employed between April and December 2019. The scheme you mentioned in Scotland is £2,000 of a grant to those individuals. That would be £4 million. That's not a huge amount of money. The member has an additional minute. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And the point is very well made by the member. Thank you very much. We must, of course, spend our resources carefully and responsibly. And I understand that the Department is particularly risk-averse following its uh, failures under RHI. However, the Minister should not sit and wait for the Executive to give a green light to everything that she has the authority to do. We are facing a major economic crisis. Our business support schemes should not be underspending by such large magnitudes. I know on this the Minister requires Executive go-ahead. And I noted last week's committee meeting that the mention of an options paper went to the Executive. But it doesn't contain a recommendation to help the particular group of people that we're talking about today. Another ministerial failure. Mr Speaker, there is great anger and will be even greater anger amongst the public if at the end of this financial year there could have been funds available to support the Northern Ireland economy and that anger will be manifest if the Minister returns money to the Centre or to uh, HM Treasury. In closing, uh, Mr Speaker, we need action, we need it now, and today the Minister is going to get and is having a very clear message from this House to support our sole traders and our micro-businesses. I hope that she will sort this out once and for all. Today is the day for the Minister to bring good news to this sector and our economy. The spotlight is on her. It's up to her to succeed or fail. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. And I call Gary Middleton. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And I welcome the opportunity to speak uh, on this motion. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted on all our lives. Faced with the largest public health issue of our time, the executive and ministers have had to respond to put in place arrangements to treat those infected while trying to limit the spread of the disease by introducing social distancing regulations. As a result of these social distancing regulations, there is no doubt that many lives have been saved. That was always the priority. These essential regulations have also, however, affected our economy significantly. The Economy Minister and the Executive have had to rapidly respond and make decisions to support the many businesses and individuals who are affected and facing a major reduction in income. It will be no surprise to many in this chamber or outside that the health department was uh, the, the largest in terms of uh, money spent with COVID. But the Department for the Economy significantly outweighs all other departments in its COVID-19 funding response. We should recognise the significant amounts of money given out in direct support to businesses during this crisis alongside other sectors. There have been 20 initiatives launched through the Department for the Economy. Some of those include the business support grant schemes, totalling over £300 million, the Micro Business Fund, the apprenticeship intervention packages, and the higher education and skills packages. Whilst another minister within this chamber had to be instructed to insist those within her remit, the Economy Minister has been proactive in getting support packages in place. I will indeed. I just want to correct the inaccuracy. The First and Deputy First Minister have very clearly stated that they have to confer powers on the Infrastructure Minister to assist within uh, the taxi industry and the coach industry, etc., because the Economy Minister had failed to do so. So I am fed up with this misinformation, this disingenuous nature of comments in this chamber from others who ought to know better. Order, members. Order, members. 
I, I think Middleton, the member you. for intervention, however, she is incorrect. Uh, the minister, unfortunately, the minister of infrastructure did drag her feet on this issue. Uh, the public will judge for themselves, but unfortunately, that is not uh, the topic of this debate today. The debate is around the fact that the Department for the Economy has been proactive in trying to get support packages in place. It is important, however, to recognise that whilst there were many businesses who were able to continue to trade, there were other businesses and individuals who suffered significant economic hardship and fell through the cracks of support. There are also specific sectors who continue to face very challenging times and need support too. The aerospace, the tourism, hospitality industries are just some of those areas uh, which need support. There are significant challenges ahead. We have to deal with the immediate issue of trying to uh, prevent a second lockdown, which would be devastating for the economy. So we, we need to be mindful of that when we have these conversations. The other issue being the, the furlough scheme ending, and I know the executive has written uh, to uh, the UK government to express our feelings on the need to ensure that... Yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much indeed for the member to give away. I just asked if the member would confirm, of course, that his party, all of his party, are fully supportive of the measures that the executive are taking to prevent the spread of COVID. I should have reminded the member of the last intervention that you have an additional minute. Yeah. I, I thank the member for his intervention. I think the First Minister has clarified that the executive has been very clear in terms of uh, the measures that are in place. But I think in all of this, it is important to, to be mindful that there's the health risk of a second lockdown, but another lockdown will be completely uh, devastating for our economy. And I think that there wouldn't be too much left uh, if we were to come out the other end of that. The executive collectively must determine what the greatest challenges are and be strategic in the support offered given the budget envelope that it operates in. This could be in the form of further grant schemes, but as the economy opens up, I think that it is important that there needs to be further help for skills, training, marketing, exporting, and securing supply chains. I know that's something specifically that's raised with us on a regular basis. I do, uh, like the Chair of the Economy Committee, welcome the 32 bids that have been put in which focus on economic recovery, all aligned with the economic uh, recovery strategy. Uh, the aim of that is to help the vulnerable, but also to ensure that viable businesses uh, and sectors are still there to provide people with jobs. So going forward, uh, Mr Speaker, I, I, I do uh, thank the member for bringing the motion. The Minister has been very clear in terms of wanting to get support out uh, as, as rapidly and as quickly as possible, where she is able to do so and where uh, we can ensure that those uh, who, who require the support can get it. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. And I call Gemma Dolan. As spokesperson for Employment and Workers' Rights, it is deeply concerning to hear of the threat of large-scale redundancies facing workers at this time. The Minister herself has acknowledged that more than 100,000 people could become unemployed by the end of 2020. Of course, we already know that the number of people claiming unemployment benefit has more than doubled from March to August, going from 800 to 62,700. The past few months have seen workers and unions try to negotiate redundancy packages. While not all redundancies can be prevented, redundancies are always an option of last resort. Redundancies in the North have also more than doubled over the year with August seeing 700 redundancies proposed and 820 redundancies confirmed, and a further 880 have been proposed in the current month, month up until yesterday. Economic leadership and the right economic interventions can help businesses to mitigate job losses. While I acknowledge the Minister has attempted to mitigate job losses and support businesses, her inaction is literally costing people jobs and putting many people out of business. Let us not forget that behind every one of these numbers is a person who has to pay for food, shelter and more than likely raise a family. The Minister has regularly tried to divert attention to the wider Executive and the Finance Minister for her lack of action. But in reality, the Finance Minister has consistently provided funding to the Department for Economy when it was needed. The Department for Finance provided a total of £411 million to the Department for Economy in order to finance the Small Business Grant, Hospitality, Tourism and Retail Sectors Grant and the Student Hardship Grant. The responsibility for making bids lies with the Economy Minister, who is responsible for economic policy. The Minister cannot continue to pick and choose when she wishes to assume this responsibility. For the sake of non-readable businesses 
small manufacturing businesses, the newly self-employed, sole traders and micro-businesses, I urge that the Minister takes heed of these comments made here today and makes a necessary funding bid to support those who have been left behind by previous schemes. Thank you, and I call <coughs> Christopher Stalford. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, over the course of the last eight months, uh, the, the word unprecedented has managed to become a cliche um, because we all refer to the unprecedented <coughs> excuse me, times in which we are living. But they are unprecedented times, and at the time that devolution was first restored, I don't think any of us could have foreseen what this year would bring. Not only has there been obviously a, a significant health crisis, but as a direct consequence of that, and as a consequence of the decisions that we made, there is an economic crisis because we decided to put vast swathes of the Northern Ireland economy into cold storage. And those are the decisions that we took uh, based on the advice that was given. I think as a general principle, everyone should accept that the best and speediest way to economic recovery will not be uh, government largesse, but will be opening up as much of the economy as we can, as quickly as we can, within the advice that's given to us. Government is not the solution to every problem, but I think, on the whole, the Northern Ireland Executive can stand over the record that it has. I think that we can point to the significant investment that has been made in order to help keep our country al alive, literally, and to keep our economy alive. Happy to. Thank you very much. I accept that the government is not the answer to every problem, but why is it the answer to every problem for some and no problem for others? Not quite sure the point that the, the member, member is has making. An additional minute. Thank you. I'm not quite sure what the point is that the member is making, but I certainly accept that there have been people who have missed the opportunity uh, for help. And it is important that uh, we, if we are in a position to, if we can afford to, we should help them and assist them. Of course we should. Um, because, as I was about to say, it does take a lot of courage and bravery to start a business. And people invest their life savings in businesses and new projects and trying to provide a means of income for their family and support for their, their kids. And, of course, if we are in a position to assist those people, then we absolutely should do so. The question is, are we in a position to do so? Is the budget line there? Does the resource exist? What options are the executive presently looking at? And I welcome the fact that the economy minister said that an options paper has been forwarded to uh, the executive for consideration. I also would be interested, and I hope that the uh, minister will outline it. I have no intention of attempting to play the economy minister off against the finance minister. I don't think that's useful or helpful. But then when members of the finance minister's party take to their feet and attack the economy minister, it's then worth asking, how many bids does the Department for the Economy presently have lodged with the Department for Finance? And awaiting a response, I would be interested, and I hope that the minister will be in a position to answer that in her summing up. I think, just one moment, and I will, in these times, I think it's important that we should have a singular direction and a singular focus from the executive. And there have been occasions throughout the last eight months where that has been undermined. But I think it's important, especially when we're talking about people who, as I've said, have many, in many cases invested their life savings into starting an enterprise, of course it's important that we should be examining the options that are available for us to help them. I give way to Ms. Sugden. 
Uh, thank you, the member, for giving way. Um, I recognise that this is a whole of a Northern Ireland executive approach and assistance to try and help the people of Northern Ireland. You are one government after all. You know, uh, but I do think that it has to be led by the economy minister. But will the member acknowledge that there are, other, there are other financial supports, for example, rates relief, which could be extended to some of those who have been excluded? And I know with questions that I have asked the finance minister, he's not prepared to do that. So I do think that this has to be a whole government approach rather than pointing fingers. Every uh, government department, I think, has made a positive contribution to helping keep our economy going. It's not just the grant schemes from the Department for the Economy, but also, as the member mentioned, uh, rates relief from the Department of Finance, uh, childcare support from the Department for Education, support for charities from the Department for Communities, uh, interventions from DERA and the Minister there. And the Executive is pointing in, in the right direction on that. I also want to make just a final point. There are other instruments that can be used to help our economy beyond simple cash handouts from the government. Money can be spent in terms of training, in terms of marketing, in terms of trying to attract people and investment here. And I think that's something that we're going to have to be, particularly marketing this place as a good place to do business, is something that I think we're going to have to know. I've got four seconds. The, the, marketing no this place as a, a good place to do business is something that uh, we should be doing, and I think I felt my four seconds better than Stuart Dixon ever could. Actually, it took maybe ten, but anyway, uh, I'll call Linda Dillon. My point was those who are excluded, Mr. Salford, and and Mr. Dunn also outlined that any underspend should be directed towards the economy minister. The economy minister herself had 60 million of an underspend. Maybe that should have been directed towards these people. So I'd like to welcome the motion and the calls for a fund to be implemented to support those impacted and left behind by previous schemes. A report by the Centre for Progressive Policy published in April found that Mid-Ulster is likely to suffer much greater than many other areas. Mid-Ulster is my constituency a constituency that I'm very proud of. I'm very proud of the hard work that people have put in in that area against all of the odds to build up their businesses. And I've stated before in this chamber that Mid Ulster has the highest rate of VAT registered businesses outside of Belfast. That's in spite of the fact that we get no foreign direct investment, despite of the fact that there's poor infrastructure in terms of access to good roads and facilities, including electricity. It is because we are very lucky to have a strong history of engineering and small manufacturing entrepreneurs in Mid Ulster, who, against all the odds and in very difficult and challenging times and historical underinvestment, have built their businesses. And now, yet again, they are the ones to be left out and abandoned by our economy minister. The Mid Ulster economy is heavily reliant on manufacturing, and according to Manufacturing NA, will not survive. 12% of firms believe they will not survive until the end of the year. Other economic projections show that the closure of furlough is also likely to result in significant job losses in this sector. With this in mind, it is difficult to understand why the Minister continues to leave behind small manufacturers from support schemes. The Minister continues to insist that she has made bids for funding, but we would like to see the detail of these bids and how they are actually going to benefit our small manufacturers. I could give many examples, as others in this, in this House have done today, how the impact of not getting any funding support has, been, has impacted some businesses. And I have a number of examples around couples who happen to share the same premises. And it won't address the issue that the member across the House, Claire Sugden, raised around rate relief, because these businesses are couples who perhaps share one premises, but they're two separate businesses, but only one business could actually benefit from the scheme and get the £10,000. That meant because you were part of a couple who happened to build a premise together, but had two separate businesses, paid all of your bills separately, you lost out on any form of support. These people need to get assistance. They need to get support. 
Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I recognise the issue she is raising, um, and it's something that I actually intend to raise with the finance minister because I believe that that is a flaw in the scheme, and I think that those businesses should have been supported because the, the intent around that scheme was to provide financial assistance, not to pay off their bills insofar as their premises. So, would, would the member support me in, in lobbying the finance minister to try and ensure that those businesses that exist in the one property but only have one rates bill would be entitled to that same support? The member has an additional minute. Thank you. I believe that scheme is an economy. It is the economy minister's scheme. It's, it was delivered by LPS simply because that was the quickest way to get it out. But it's actually the economy minister we need to lobby in relation to that. And I think that we absolutely I would support you in relation to that. And the last point that I want to make is that all ministers need to carry out their own responsibilities. It is the responsibility of the economy minister to come up with proposals and schemes. It is her responsibility to put those bids to the Finance Minister. It is then his responsibility, and I would sincerely hope he would do so, to finance the schemes. As I say, we have all been lobbied by these excluded groups. They need support. The fact that they have survived to date does not mean that they do not need support. They have many outstanding bills, but they have struggled on, and as was outlined by Mr Stewart, with many challenges in terms of their own mental health, they have struggled on. They need support. They need it now. I have asked questions of the Economy Minister on a number of occasions in this chamber, and I have to say I don't believe I've got a simple, straight answer to any of them around how we're going to support these excluded people. So I would ask that everybody support this motion, that we support those who are newly self-employed and those who have worked hard to establish businesses and have yet to date received no support. Gormagut. And I call Justin McNulty. Can I thank the member for bringing this important motion before the House today, which I am happy to support. Over the past six months, I have been inundated with pleas for help from businesses in my constituency. And whilst they were, they were able to, we were able to guide them to many of the support uh, packages, the grants, the furlough scheme, and the package for the self-employed, there, there are a significant number of people and businesses who have fallen through the safety net of supports. I come from a border constituency, and one of the major issues I have come across has been a lack of support for cross-border workers. People who have not been able to access the Irish Government's pandemic payment scheme or the job retention scheme here, and who have been left to fur on universal credit. Highly skilled people who support their families and who struggle to, to keep their families going on universal credit. I have raised this issue with everyone, from the First Minister to the Deputy First Minister, the Economy and Communities Ministers, the Finance Minister, I have also written to the Taoiseach Tanistra and uh, the Social Protection Ministers in Dublin. Many of my um, highly skilled, many of my constituents across the border daily for, for work are highly skilled workers engaged mainly in the construction sectors who pay their taxes and who feel abandoned both north and south. The responses I received from all the people I wrote to were uniform to a point, and they all point to the relevant EU law, and they all agree the responsibility to bring forward a bespoke package for the cross-border worker is with the Department for Communities. Everyone said the responsibility lay with the Minister for Communities. That is apart from the Minister for Communities and her party colleagues. And I agree with the previous speaker. Every minister should fulfil the responsibility. Then, there are the newly self-employed and the self-employed who are deemed as company directors. They are frustrated, scared and financially on their knees. They are the entrepreneurs who are the bedrock of our economy. They have bravely taken the risk to establish a business and their staff, their staff can be furloughed and yet they have nothing. And then there are those businesses who have multiple premises. They were ruled ineligible for business support grants. They are small independent traders. They have shops and outlets in different towns or cities. They too are entrepreneurs and are the backbone of our high streets. And yet someone in Netherlands thought they should not be eligible for support. Despite a package being put in place by the Scottish Government for similar companies in Scotland. Finally, there has been a dreadful treatment of our bus, coach, taxi and haulage industry. No. 
After months of denying responsibility, the Minister for, of the Economy surrendered the power and responsibility to the Executive last week and has now been passed to the Infrastructure Minister to deal with. I am confident that the Minister, hopefully with the support of the Finance Minister, will deliver a package of support the sector so badly needs and fast. Some in this House try to suggest that this was a game of ping pong, but take the politics out of this and the politicians out of this. Listen to the sector and to one of our leaders who spoke unequivocally on the radio yesterday, Karen McGill, and called it as you saw it. And she noted who has been consistently honest and supportive of the sector through all these months, and that was Nicola Mallon. Concordia, I strongly support the delivery of supports and or a support package for those who have fallen through the safety net of supports. This is, yes. Thank you to the member for giving way. Um, I appreciate a lot of this arrived in this House very fast, and there was an initial learning curve on who should step up for what, for what particular issue. But would the member agree with me? When we resolve these issues, at every point, we have to find the speediest, fastest vehicle to getting help to those people who need it. And there are examples of that not happening, and that deeply concerns me. The member has an additional minute. Thank the member for her contribution. I agree. To, uh, people who are on their knees financially, they just want support. They don't, know, they don't care where it comes from. I strongly support the delivery of, a, of supports and or support package for those who have fallen through the safety nets of supports. This is imperative for services in our community, for businesses and for jobs. If this place is to mean anything to the people we represent, we must act collectively and deliver a package of support for those who need it the most and who need it now. Thank you. And I call John O'Dowd. Um, and it has been an interesting debate. Uh, with a wee bit of ping pong in it in terms of political responsibility or roles within the executive. Uh, I, I suspect businesses and sole traders and the self employed won't care which minister delivers it as long as it's delivered. Uh, and the minutiae and the workings of the executive are of little interest to them. But unfortunately we all have to work the processes that are in place in the executive and in the assembly uh, and the financial management of all those processes to ensure that proper processes are followed. Now, I admire any minister who rolls up their sleeves and says, look, I'll have a bit of that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, stick my name into somebody else's affairs. I'm going to work to try and ensure that a project is delivered, whether it's in response to COVID-19 or anything else. Uh, and that's what's needed uh, across the executive. That's what's needed now. But I want to take one step back uh, before uh, getting into the heart of, of the motion. Before COVID-19 hit us, we had another major economic crisis looming over us, Brexit. The uncertainty around Brexit, the implications of Brexit, uh, were, uh, and the ongoing uh, political shenanigans around Brexit, will be hard enough for any economy to deal with without having to add COVID-19 to it. And then COVID-19 came, and we've got that added to us. But before all of those things, it's worth noting that our economy uh, even prior to this pandemic, had less businesses per head than England, Scotland and Wales, and also had the lowest number of business startups anywhere across these islands. So our economy was in bad shape before all of these things. Uh, and the economy under the charge of, of successive DEP ministers has never been kick-started. It has never seen the, the promise of the Good Friday Agreement and of the institutions being driven forward in terms of that economic regeneration. Now, in fairness to those economy ministers and to the executive, we had a worldwide recession in 2008, so it's always going to be difficult for anybody who's in charge. But the point I'm trying to make is this. Following the same old isn't going to get us out of this crisis. And I have serious concerns. And listening to the, the presentations today from the DUP benches only confirms those concerns that the DUP's motivation or the DUP's thinking behind this is driven by a number of factors. One, they don't like government intervention in the economy. I think Mr Stalford has more than hinted at that, if not confirmed that today. Uh, they don't see that uh, as, as a, an economic way forward. I do. Even in normal times, I believe there's a responsibility on the government to 
to uh, have economic interventions. And even the most right wing of Tories intervene in the economy, but they intervene in the economy for the favour of a certain section uh, of society. And two, I have the view, and I said this at the, the Economy Committee the other day, the minister, just let me finish this point, the minister has made a decision in this regard, and she has decided not to fund these groups. And follow the evidence on that, and I'll let Mr Stolford and then I'll finish my point. It's interesting to hear the member for Upper Ban uh, proclaim himself uh, an interventionist. That being the case, why is he so determined to keep us living under EU state aid rules? The member has an extra minute. I, I, I'm not, and nor is my party, a defender of EU fiscal policy. Uh, the EU has many merits, but there's also things wrong with the EU. Uh, and in terms of the need for government to intervene, I, I would disagree with them on that. But the point I'm making is the Minister has made a decision. And the evidence points me in that direction. The contributions today point me in that direction, and also in terms of the most recent bids from the Department of Economy to the Executive, to the Finance Minister. There was 32 bids made, totalling £78 million, and not one of the bids was for uh, the excluded, the sole trader, the directors who we are discussing today. And that says to me, if there's no bid, there's no uh, proposal within the Department of the Economy to support those groups. And I'm also concerned about the prioritisation of those bids. The, bid, the bids are prioritised from 1 to 32. The first bid is for the technology sector. Now, you could say, yes, that's very valid. Uh, it, it's a sector with a future. But it's also one of the sectors that has uh, weathered the storm of COVID-19 the most. It is one of the sectors, and parts of it, have actually flourished during COVID-19. So why is it number one priority? And that says to me that it's the same old thinking that's going on that was previously there in previous e economy ministers, which meant that we, did, we had the lowest business startups, we have lower productivity, we have uh, higher levels of economic inactivity than many parts of these islands. And what I'm saying is we need a new direction. We need new thinking. And part of that new thinking has to be an acceptance that those groups that are holding up our economy now are, are shoring up our economy need support. It because Yes, we should be chasing international investment. We should be chasing technology firms. We should be chasing all those things. But to see the people who are maintaining the economy now are many of the people who are listed in this motion and need support. Because if we lose them, we are certainly going to have 100,000 unemployed by the end of this year, but we're going to have more. So I appeal to the Minister to change her decision. Because my view is a decision has been made to change her decision and make a recommendation to the Finance Minister and to the Executive for a viable proposal, Members, a affordable up. proposal to support these bodies. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Andrew Muir. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, on a Friday night in uh, mid-May, businesses across my constituency and Northern Ireland learned that they would be excluded from the much-trailed hardship scheme. Trailed for weeks, details of the scheme were eventually released at 9 p.m. on a Friday night leaving many in tears, desperate for help, and hoping that they wouldn't be forgotten and picked up by a further scheme. It is nothing short of disgraceful that exactly four months on from that Friday night announcement we are having this debate today because of the inaction to provide that support required. From the very start of this crisis, I have been in regular contact with businesses in my constituency who have been left in utter despair. Schemes have been announced in other parts of the UK, covering businesses, just like them, Northern Ireland receives the equivalent funding. Owners await announcements from the Minister for the Economy, and if anything gets eventually brought forward, they are excluded from it. I have so many examples of businesses in North Down and beyond who are not able to access business support grants for so many reasons, whether it be that their business rates were over the NAV thresholds, some very marginally, one example of a pound. Um, or company directors with no PIOAE employees who could not apply for the hardship fund, domestic ratepayers such as bed and breakfast owners, or those who did not operate out of fixed property who could not apply for grants based upon rateable value, and the newly self-employed who did not meet the criteria for the UK self-employed uh, support scheme. Mr Speaker, 
Unfortunately, a number of these businesses have not survived the last six months of inaction. For, the, for, for those who have, they desperately need financial assistance now if they are not going to go the same way as others. Not only is providing help for those currently excluded morally the right thing to do, but it is the right thing for the economy today. The Minister has said she does not have the data available to provide the support that has been asked for, but this fails to understand that the issue is beyond the newly self-employed, nor looks at what Wales was able to achieve without the HMRC data. Minister, where there is a will, there is a way. Yes. For giving way. Well, I appreciate that argument has been made by officials and by the Minister about the lack of data. The key to other schemes has been demonstrating hardship. There are some businesses that are doing very well. They are not asking for support. They have managed to ride the storm and actually sp- and, and grow their businesses. Others are experiencing massive hardship. And if that criteria can be demonstrated, raw data is not needed. The bank account information is there. If their turnover has been decimated, then surely they should be able to access a fund without that raw data. The member has an extra minute. Very much, Mr. Speaker. I entirely agree with the member. Unfortunately, my impression is that there isn't the will, so a way is not being found. And I think we are able to look at hardship and look at other schemes that have been rolled out across the rest of the United Kingdom. Finally, on the subject of money, we hear that there isn't the funding available to support everyone. I acknowledge the financial challenges facing this executive, but news I have received today from the finance minister that over £124 million is assigned but is yet unallocated to a pending economic recovery strategy because of non-submitted bids or delayed bids does not inspire confidence in the Department nor the Minister. Figures to support the excluded, such as £300 are bandied about without drilling into the potential demand and assume that everyone needs £10,000. Proper examination of the issue would, I suggest, reveal a different result, but unfortunately it was only last week when the Minister met with representatives from Excluded NI to explore their needs uh, and how they could be met. After I requested the meeting and BBC Radio Ulster questioned the Minister whether she would go to the meeting. In conclusion, Mr Speaker, it is long beyond time that the Minister for the Economy brings forward a hardship scheme for businesses that have been excluded from existing support packages. I have written to the Minister about the issues arising from this debate on numerous occasions and are unfortunately only eventually received generic responses offering little more than tea and sympathy. Minister, the time for tea and sympathy is up. The time for action is now. Okay, and I now call Roy Beggs and can advise the member you have four minutes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, the motion, I rise to support the motion. The motion begins by talking about the Kick Start scheme. A scheme that helps the 16 to 24 year olds who are in universal credit get into employment. It was announced that it was going to be applied to England, Scotland and Wales, and Northern Ireland wasn't mentioned. It has been operational since the 2nd of September. What is happening in Northern Ireland? This helps young people. It also helps businesses as well, as those young people work in those businesses and helps our economy. And what we don't want is some experiment with our own individual system and then find out we've made flaws. We, l- we should learn from RHI. If there's a system uh, widely applied, we can quickly learn from it and get it on the ground. We all have to recognise that there has been much support uh, provided in Northern Ireland. We are fortunate to be part of the United Kingdom. There is the furlough scheme which the Chancellor has footed the bill for. Thank goodness that has been there to date. But clearly, it cannot disappear. It needs, uh, we need a further continuation of some sort to assist those who are relying on it. Otherwise, we in Northern Ireland will particularly lose out and are, are at huge risk of losing thousands of jobs. Jobs where skilled teams have been put together and they risk being decimated. So we need to look carefully at that and we need to make sure there is something continuing. There has also been COVID support through a range of other measures. Uh, the, the business support grant paid out through the uh, rate system was a good, quick way of getting money out on the ground. But we do have to recognise that there has been a degree of concern that it may not always go where it's needed. I've heard of wind farm owners getting uh, uh, additional monies when they still, still have their wind turbine turning there. So, so clearly there, there are some that who have benefited from that may not have needed it. Uh, there's also been a range of other uh, business uh, support grants, 
uh, and in particular also some help for, for apprentices. So we do have to recognise that. But we also have to recognise that there are many who have been excluded. And this has attempted to be an address in other parts of the United Kingdom. The question is, why has it not been worked on here? There are those who are newly self-employed, uh, many micro-businesses who may actually operate from home and therefore not benefit from the business support grant. Many of those businesses will have taken great risks, perhaps mortgaged their houses, taken loans, and they may not be in a position to take further loans that are on offer. We need to recognise that those additional loans which have to be repaid are more likely to benefit larger, more established businesses. But we also have to recognise that many of these people uh, who have set up their businesses, uh, who are perhaps employing uh, only themselves and may even be paid through um, dividend, so they're on wage, they don't qualify. These are our entrepreneurs. These are people who put their neck out there, who think of new ideas, who can generate new employment in the future. So it's important that we recognise that these are important to our economy, important to recognise that they are not excluded. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased that this, this, this week um, the Executive Office granted powers to the Infrastructure Minister so that the taxi industry and the coach industry and perhaps wider transport sector can, can benefit. But why has it taken so long to widen that power so that someone can address it? Why, have they not, why, why are those all who have been excluded to date not been included uh, 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 by a scheme, as has been indicated by my colleagues, through some sort of hardship intervention? There are those that are operating in other parts of the UK, and we must ensure that businesses and companies and employees can survive without uh, facing huge burdens of debt and going under. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd now like to call the Economy Minister, with Diane Dodds, and the Minister will have 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank you to the members for this motion and debate. A range of important and relevant areas have been covered this morning, and I will take each of the key issues that have been discussed in turn. Firstly, I share the deep concern expressed in this House of the significant impact that COVID-19 has had on the Northern Ireland economy. It is undeniable that the economic impact has been significant, has had uh, implications across the entire economy. Huge economic impacts that might normally take months or years to unfold occurred within weeks as a result of lockdown and industry shutdowns. My department estimates that during the lockdown, output in our economy was operating at 25% below normal. Nearly all sectors were affected by the social distancing measures, and many businesses have availed of business support schemes and grants from both the national government and the Northern Ireland Executive. The motion references the extensive range of support put in place by our government. And this has provided a much needed lifeline for many local businesses and individuals. The shutdown of many industries resulted in the widespread furloughing of workers, just under 250,000, almost a third of those eligible here, and around 78,000 availing of the self-employment income support schemes. Together, these claims amounted to over 1 billion in support uh, for jobs in Northern Ireland. Despite this, there has been a spike in the claimant count over the last three months. July was the third month in a row that the number of claimants were above 60,000, levels last seen in 2012 and 2013, after the previous recession. To put it another way, this is around seven years of jobs growth wiped out in a matter of weeks. Although the local economy is showing signs of recovery, with many sectors improving, it may take some time before we see economic activity overall back to its pre-pandemic levels. I do not underestimate the challenges that lie ahead of us. And that is why again from this chamber this morning, I reiterate my call for an extension of the furlough scheme because it is important that we continue to support jobs in our local economy and sectors where that tail of recovery will be longer uh, than uh, perhaps in others. 
The executive has difficult decisions. No, I'm not giving way. Um, I, I have a lot to get through, and I will reference many of the points that uh, members have made during the debate. The executive has difficult decisions to take about what and where interventions can and should be made, what form of support is offered, and needs to ensure that spending can be justified as providing value for money and will make a positive impact in the medium to long term. Not all businesses or individuals have been impacted in the same way by COVID. Some businesses effectively stopped trading, whilst others continued as normal or even saw an increase in productivity. And indeed, it was a delight yesterday uh, to announce a further 50 jobs in the digital sector, created indeed by one of our own who has gone to America um, and is responsible for many of the foreign direct investments uh, that have come to Northern Ireland. Likewise, since moving to reopen the economy, some sectors have seen an immediate pickup, whilst others will face much longer challenges or challenges further down the line. I have already referenced hospitality and aerospace. I make the point because the executive with a limited amount of financial firepower must be targeted and strategic and recognise that the economy is in a different place today than it was during lockdown and that support will come in different forms. Clearly, when the economy was in lockdown, we needed to get money out to businesses quickly. As part of our immediate Northern Ireland response to the pandemic, my executive colleagues and I introduced an unprecedented range of local financial support to help those impacted by COVID-19. This support had the objective of protecting jobs, preventing business closures, and promoting economic recovery. My department led on the business support grant schemes and the Micro Business Hardship Fund. We have paid out over 340 million to date uh, across the schemes, providing much needed support to many businesses experiencing hardship. As well as the business support measures administered by my department, there has been a range of further support provided locally. The executive put in place four months rates holiday for all business and a 12 months relief, uh, rate relief for businesses in targeted sectors. There have also been funds made available for childcare, charities, sports clubs, amongst other areas. Whilst there was an extensive range of support provided, it is not simply possible for the executive to support every individual uh, and business facing hardship uh, within the funding envelope available, and I will say more on this later. The executive is currently preparing an economic recovery uh, framework. And I would also commend, uh, as essential reading, Rebuilding a Stronger uh, Economy to the proposer of the motion. This uh, document has guided uh, our path uh, in the department over the last number of weeks. This provides a framework for the next 12 to 18 months to build a more competitive, inclusive and greener economy by addressing the key structural weaknesses in our economy and focusing on sectors where there is potential for growth and higher paying jobs. This does not mean that other sectors will be ignored. All sectors bring their own unique benefits to our economic ecosystem. To drive forward this agenda, I have secured 25 million to deliver digital and online selling, improvements to operational processes and supply chain resilience, the use of new technologies, business planning, and the provision of loans and equity investment. I have reallocated 13.6 million from my budget to address pressures in skills and education. I have submitted um, over 32 bids to the Department of Finance to deliver a wide ranging and comprehensive program of interventions to further the rebuilding agenda. And I must say that I do agree with Mr. Dixon that it would be inexcusable that money uh, should be returned at the end of what would be uh, an extremely difficult and challenging period. And that is why, again today in this chamber, I am urging the Finance Minister to get on with the allocations uh, of the funding that he received after the Chancellor's July economic update. No, I'm not giving way. Um, I have established the Tourism Recovery Steering Group and I'm working on the draft tourism recovery action plan. And many of those 32 bids 
would support actions within that plan. I have allocated 14 million to fund an apprenticeship return, retain and result initiative and over 12 million to fund an apprenticeship recruitment incentive initiative and over half a million pounds to an apprenticeship challenge fund. And may I address also Mr Begg's point about the kickstart scheme. I do agree with you that Northern Ireland uh, could benefit from a kickstart scheme and actually last week spoke uh, to the Minister for Communities because Kickstart is essentially an employment scheme as opposed to a training scheme and offered her my and my department's help in the development of that scheme. She had confirmed to me that they are currently scoping out such a scheme for Northern Ireland and I hope it will come forward uh, fairly quickly. I have also recently, along with uh, Invest NI, uh, announced one million in a digital selling capability grant and a five million equity investment fund targeted at early stage and seed stage SMEs, uh, both of which opened for applications uh, the, last week. This is a record of work and support from the Department of the Economy. And I thank my colleague from FOIL for referencing the Audit Office report which indicates that far, by far and away, after health, where you would expect those uh, actions in a health pandemic, the economy department has been prolific in its support for the economy and businesses in Northern Ireland. Again, I recommend it as essential reading. So now I come to the second part of the motion. This motion specifically references sole traders and micro-businesses who were unable to access the business support measures as they did not meet uh, the eligibility criteria. Within the available funding, the Hardship Fund aimed to support as many businesses as possible. However, with approximately 125,000 businesses in Northern Ireland and a budget of 40 million, difficult choices had to be made regarding the number and type of businesses that could be supported and my decisions um, and, uh, around the hardship scheme were also supported by the executive as a whole. However, I know that people are still hurting and that there is still more work to do. Whilst the majority of self-employed people were eligible for the self-employed income support scheme if their business was uh, adversely affected by COVID, I do recognise that a key group that have been unable to access the self-employment scheme are those who have recently become self-employed. I think that everyone would acknowledge that there would be challenges in establishing that local scheme as access to a national database would be required via HMRC. However, um, I, and I have written uh, to uh, them uh, to inquire about such access. I also understand that the Department of Finance has contacted uh, Her Majesty's Treasury regarding a number of issues within the UK-wide schemes, including widening the eligibility of criteria of the self-employed income support scheme to include those who have recently become self-employed. I have further proposed that the executive write to the Chancellor to look again at some of the people that have been omitted from the scheme and to consider bringing forward measures across the UK. I will also work, of course, with my colleagues in Westminster who have been uh, extremely vocal in support of that UK-wide scheme and the need for UK-wide measures to bring in these levels of support. Should support not be forthcoming, and should the executive collectively determine that, it is, that a bespoke local scheme is required, I will, of course, be happy to deliver such a scheme. Members have referenced the money that has been underutilised from, no, from the three business support measures led by my department. I would like to make it clear, particularly for Ms Dillon, who seems to be uh, under some uh, misunderstanding uh, in these matters, that my department administered the business support measures on behalf of the executive. This was not Department of the Economy core funding. 
Underutilised funds have been returned to the Department of Finance, as was requested from the very outset of the schemes. These will be used to reallocate for further funding and support. To aid this process, I have provided an options paper to the Executive with a wide-ranging list of areas where there would be gaps. This, no, this has been discussed on a number uh, of occasions. On the 13th of August, on the proposal of the Finance Minister, it was agreed that the reallocation of the underspend from the business support measures would be considered as part of the overall funding allocation to deliver the Executive's recovery framework. I look forward to getting ahead uh, with uh, that recovery framework, with seeing the list uh, of proposals, from, uh, including those that have been in my options paper, from uh, the Executive, um, and uh, to getting down to work uh, in um, making these things happen. Can I also say, in relation to uh, manuf uh, small manufacturing companies, of course, again, at my instigation, we widened the scope of the 10K scheme to include those small manufacturing businesses that uh, benefited from industrial derating. I would be happy to join with Ms Dillon in writing to the Finance Minister and indicating that I would also support further uh, rating relief for manufacturing businesses, not just in Mid-Ulster, which I visited recently, um, but right across Northern Ireland. No. Um, um, in conclusion, let me be absolutely clear. The scale of the challenge facing our economy is unprecedented. Getting our economic, societal and health-focused response to recovery right is absolutely vital. We must all ensure the decisions we take are strategically focused, but also support families and jobs in Northern Ireland. And I remain committed to working with my executive colleagues to continue to support businesses and individuals as best we can moving forward, recognising that the next few months will be extremely challenging, not just um, for the executive, but for families and Thank prosperity you. in Northern Ireland. Thank, Thank you, you Mr Speaker. Thank you. And I now call Steve Egan to conclude and wind up the debate. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. And may I thank everybody for being involved in this debate today. But as I'm sure as many of you are uh, willing and will grant me this indulgence, I shall have most of my remarks directed at the Minister for the Economy. Um, there is a fundamental issue here. The Northern Ireland economy is driven by the small and medium enterprise sector. It is an entrepreneurial economy. We have heard even in January of this year, the Ulster University Business School said that Northern Ireland has created an ecosystem for entrepreneurs, 100,000 odd small SME companies. We have more SME companies and entrepreneurs in Northern Ireland than we do per head of capita in Wales, Scotland and the north of England. But we can say we had that ecosystem. We had that ecosystem that was supportive of our entrepreneurial sector. We have heard from people across all of Northern Ireland the importance of the manufacturing sector, small companies, small directors, people taking risks. And one of the biggest issues we have in Northern Ireland is that we need to encourage more of this risk taking. We need to encourage our companies and people to become involved in business. We see in West Tyrone, we see a manufacturing sector that is unique across these islands and the ability to develop new products and new ideas. We see in our creative industry sector, we see ideas and people are willing to take risks and do something that quite frankly, nine months ago, wasn't even there. These are people who are willing to do these things. These are people who are the future of Northern Ireland. These are the people who are going to transform our economy. But this should not come as a surprise to anybody, and particularly the Minister of the Economy or the Economy Department, because this ecosystem has been growing steadily, not because of what the Department of Economy and Economy Ministers have done, 
because basically they have had to do it on their own. And they have succeeded in ways that very few people have seen. But right now, because of a system that they and an implications of a pandemic that they have no control over, that ecosystem is being killed off. And we hear about papers, we hear about proposals, we hear about bids. But we are eight months into this process. Many of these people have already gone to the wall. How many times has us as MLAs have we listened to people saying, look, I've gone to the bank and the bank says, unless you get any support, we're going to have to pull the plug? Certainly. Thank you very much. I appreciate the member giving way. Would the member agree with me that the minister actually supported the very point made by my colleague, Ms. O'Dowd, when she outlined that 50 additional jobs have been created in the IT sector because that's a flourishing industry at the moment, and yet that is where the number one bid is in relation to her bids to the to the executive. Thank you very much indeed for your intervention. And I was very struck by the remarks that were made by the Permanent Secretary of the Department of the Economy that was made to the committee. And I find it extraordinary that even a sentiment by a senior civil servant in Northern Ireland would be that some of these businesses are not worth saving. For somebody who's on a superannuated salary, who has pension, and is the permanent secretary of a department that can say, we can say the least has not had a stellar uh, record in promoting jobs or in good governance, for somebody to say that is absolutely shocking. And I think the minister should go back today and have the permanent secretary in her office and ask him to come back and apologise and make sure his remarks are changed. Because that sends a message out to every entrepreneur in Northern Ireland. And we have another example in that other... Yes, please. Member deals with a very important point. The minister today had the perfect opportunity to disavow those callous, cavalier comments by the permanent secretary. Didn't take that opportunity. Does that create a fear that, in fact, those comments are driving the approach of the department still? Thank you very much indeed for your intervention. And that takes me on to the next point. It's about the culture within the Department of the Economy. And it's about the culture about what we're trying to do to be able to support small businesses and entrepreneurs. Because they are asking for our help. They're not asking for our help because they just want another handout or they want to do something else. They want our help so there is actually these companies and these entrepreneurs still here when we get to the end of this year? Certainly. For, for, for giving way, I'm talking about those small businesses and those entrepreneurs, would he agree with me that this entire House should be appalled by the statement which the Minister made in her statement when she described them as, quote, a difficult choice? It's her job to deal with difficult choices. And I thank you very much indeed. And again, one of the things we have heard through here is we want to see some leadership. We have had eight months of committees, groups, papers, whatever. What we need to see is some leadership. We need to see somebody going out and saying, we need to be doing this. We don't want a minister who goes around and gives £53 million back without asking some fairly substantial questions about what extra resources are needed and what are we doing to try and sort out this particular part of the economy. This, to hear this in the United Kingdom and to hear this from a minister who sees very clearly what happens in England, Scotland and Wales and in some way Northern Ireland is different, the answer isn't righteous indignation and demanding more money and doing this. The answer is, let's form another committee. Let's send another paper. This is not what the people of Northern Ireland want to hear. And I was very disappointed to hear from the Minister today, because I thought the Minister would have seen where the concerns are here. I thought she would come to this House and say, these are substantial issues that need to be sorted out. I have heard. I want to do something. I want to do something for 99% of our economy. That is what the size of our economy is, the SME. Yes, certainly. But 
and uh, just on Monday or it may have come out that the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister was going to bestow powers on a different minister. Now, I need to know where they come from, what, what, how they come out. So rather than give out the grand scheme, there are powers that sit within your department, Minister, that you are now acting on and you are asking them to be moved to a different department. I hope you don't even know that. Thank you very much indeed for that. But Here's a question, and I think here's a question everybody in this assembly should be asking. Is the Department for Economy fit for purpose? Is it capable of doing its role? Now, we have already heard evidence from the Economy Committee about the language being used by the Permanent Secretary. But we're seeing something else here, and this is the fundamental bit. Where is that support out there for our SME sector? Where is that support there for an entrepreneurial sector? Does nobody actually in the Department of the Economy or the Minister actually understand what our economy is built on? Because I'm not hearing any understanding from the Minister. I have heard absolutely no, certainly. Thank the member for giving way. Um, just with regard to the language and um, understanding used by the department and the minister, would you agree with me that generic written responses outlining all the government financial support that the business is not eligible for and pointed to NI Direct when their individual circumstances are raised with the minister could be described as nothing more than a kick in the teeth? Um, I think one of the most disappointing things, uh, Mr. Speaker, is the number of times people have been told the computer says no. And the fact is, oh, you don't meet this criteria, you don't meet that criteria. Um, Mr Speaker, we're coming to the end of the time, and I could continue on pointing out the inconsistencies of the Department of Economy and the Minister. Certainly. Because he has been very generous in his giving way, unlike the Minister, it has to be said. Um, and I would ask the member if he agrees with me this is the bread and butter of Northern Ireland. In constituency offices, we will all be aware of the nature of these businesses. They're very often family owned, and it is the fundamental building blocks of our economy. I had hoped that this motion may have nudged the minister in the right direction. I'm bitterly disappointed that it appears not to be the case. And I, I do take the, the member's point that we really start to move into the realms of, do we understand our economy? And thank members, you very about much ten indeed. seconds. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Well, it will come as no surprise that I think every member of this assembly should be supporting this motion. But my final appeal to the minister is: show some leadership, sort out your department, and do something for the entrepreneurs of Northern Ireland. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the uh, members, the question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Thank you very much. Members, I could ask members to take your ease for a moment or two.